All right, I think it's about four o'clock or so. So I'm going to start talking. Um, this is uh, identity management. If this is not what you were expecting, um, yeah, I'm not sure why all of you are here, but uh, why not? So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about identity management. Um, yeah, this should be fun. Um, I was going to do like the whole Johnny Long intro, but I'm not as cool as he is, so who I am is not really relevant. Um, yeah, uh, you guys, <laughs> so um, we're talking about identity management. Hopefully um, a few of you guys know what identity management is. Let's go for a raise of hands, identity management, sweet. Uh, how many of you guys actually use some sort of identity management in your organization? Sweet, um, and how many of you guys use Novell Identity Manager? Wow, all right, so this is gonna be pretty centric around uh, Novell Identity Manager. Um, because that is what I used to do a lot of consulting on, and uh, I know it pretty well. Knew some of the uh, the ins and outs of it, and uh, found some ugly things while I was using it. And uh, going to talk about those. So, um, what this talk is not. Uh, if there is, is there anyone from Novell here? Sweet. Um, so, <laughs> uh, if Novell happens to be downloading this talk later. Um, What's that? Uh, uh, is there any press here? Is that what you mean? Um, I'm sure there's press here, and so I'm... Um, oh, well. Uh, so if Novell happens to take a look at this talk at any time in the, uh, the future, um, this is not a fix-it list. Like, I'm going to talk about some specific things that are I see as issues. Um, you, know, you guys can decide. Maybe they're issues. Maybe they're not. Um, but this is not like a, a fix-it list for Novell. I'm sure there are other things that I have not found that Novell should address. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I really hope that Novell takes uh, just a serious look at their identity management scheme, their architecture, um, kind of what they're doing in that space. Since it is billed as a security tool very often, um, I just, I, I would prefer that they go and, and look at it as a security tool and, and kind of look at some of the security implications of that, do some documentation around how to not set it up insecurely. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just got my picture taken, so uh, they now know where to find me. Um, I do uh, have very high respect for the people at Novell. Uh, Crispin, go to his talk tomorrow night. He's very smart. He's a great guy. Um, and Ed Reed, who was formerly there, um, great guy. Uh, so Novell has some great security people. Um, I just think that they have uh, pushed out some of identity management pieces a little bit faster than their security could keep up. Uh, so what is this talk? Uh, basically an attempt to convince you that identity management uh, is basically just another asset on your network. Uh, it needs to be protected just like any other asset. Um, most of you should be you know, aware of that. Uh, for the, uh, the, the not quite white hat side of the crowd, um, you know, hopefully you'll uh, see some things here to uh, take an interest in. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like for people to go out and start doing research in uh, how to uh, evaluate the security of identity management systems as they are becoming a lot more prevalent in uh, corporate environments, as we saw by the, the show of hands. Um, all this information is pulled directly from public uh, resources, straight from the websites. Um, so, you know, nothing I'm saying here is uh, acquired in any way that's, uh, you know, not public. So um, this is all public knowledge. Uh, okay, so identity management. Most of you seemed like you, you knew what it was. Um, so, you know, basically what is it? Uh, or actually, let's start with what's being said about it. Uh, this, this came out, uh, I think, yesterday or the day before. Uh, ISC sent this little quote around. Um, it, it's a front burner issue for lots of organizations. Basically, it's uh, becoming a big security issue. Uh, people in the security space are starting to look at identity management as a security tool which is great, um, it's, it's very useful as a tool, but uh, like any tool on your network, it has some liabilities. Um, and so that's basically what I'm trying to, to raise awareness about. Uh, theory of IDM, basically you have two systems, uh, generic systems basically that hold user identities and they're connected in some way by, by some meta system and that's, that's your identity management system. Uh, the identity management system continuously manages your identity throughout the uh, the, the whole uh, life cycle of that identity, um, provisioning, uh, updating your authentication tokens, granting you uh, authorization within those applications or systems, 
and uh, it should all be done in a way that can be audited and, and proved repeatable. Um, and that's basically what IDM is. Uh, specific products, you should all be familiar with them. Um, who's running identity management? Um, this is just Novell's uh, customer list off of their, uh, their publicly facing website. Uh, so there's you know, a few of them, um, universities, banks, hospitals, lots of people are using it. Uh, yeah, just do a search on identity management on the, uh, the RFPs. Uh, lo lots of government entities are, are using it. Um, so what are some common configurations? Uh, you know, typically when you think of identity management, you think of, um, or a lot of times people will think of an HR system connected to some sort of enterprise directory, which is then connected to other systems and, and it's all automatically provisioning identities, uh, controlling where there are. Um, so you know, HR database, go and send your directory. Uh, these are kind of some of the, uh, the common ones that Novell pushes, and uh, they are kind of important, as we'll see later, because um, it really does depend on, on how you set up these things as to how, they, how secure they are. Um, so what are the issues? Um, when we look at an identity management system, kind of what, what are the issues that um, come up with regards to security? Um, complexity. Uh, Bruce Schneier said yesterday, you know, hey, complexity is the enemy of security or, or something like that. Don't, don't quote me directly, but I think that's what he said. Um, but basically, you know, it's, <laughs> if you have any big complex system, it's going to be pretty difficult to secure it. Um, and identity management systems are usually very complex. Um, you look at uh, Novella's identity manager, for, for instance, um, you've got, um, you know, lots of pieces within the system itself. Uh, the uh, the systems, you know, by definition, you're talking about at least two systems, and you know these could be entire, you know, uh, server stacks. It might be a Windows stack and a Linux stack. It might be, you know, on the same server, but you know, a database system and a, a uh, an operating system, or you know, a database server and a directory. Um, but basically, you have at least two systems because obviously you wouldn't be using Identity Manager if you're not trying to manage two systems. Um, you also have management tools because um, you probably want to manage the system somehow. Um, so in the Novella space, that's you know, Designer, uh, iManager, um, formerly Console One. Uh, you have you know, different ways of doing this. Uh, User-facing applications. Uh, very, very commonly, you see uh, identity management being used to connect into some sort of, of user-facing application, uh, some sort of portal, uh, user self-service, you know, what have you. Uh, very complex systems systems in and of themselves, uh, and then you, know, you, you add on to this uh, an identity management framework, and it becomes even more complex. And uh, usually you have auditing systems in all this. Um, uh, we're dealing with identities. <laughs> so uh, naturally, they are, they are going to be fairly high value, because this is you know, usernames, passwords, or um, other authentication tokens. You know, if you're synchronizing certificates, you know, this is where your authentication tokens reside. This is where they're being synchronized. So to break into the system, um, or any of these systems, uh, is going to be a high value target. Um, it also deals with authorization. So um, I want to make the distinction there. But uh, you know, these systems are automatically, based on, on business rules, determining what you as a user are authorized to do within a system. So you know, if I can grant myself uh, full, full access rights, you know, then that's uh, that's cool. I can I can uh, break the system by doing that. Um, and of course, you're also very commonly dealing with HR systems, which uh, contain things like social security numbers and you know other other good things like that. So uh, high value targets, very complex. And uh, to be quite honest, a lot of administrators just kind of go, oh, it's Novell, it's secure. Oh, it's Novell security system. Therefore, it's it is and of itself secure. And they don't really take a step back and say, hey, how secure is it as an application, as a, as a tool on our network? How secure is it? Um, uh, you know, best practices are out there for securing um, identity management. You can go download that off of Novell's website. Um, sometimes they conflict, uh, and oftentimes they're very incomplete, I've noticed, um, as I've you know, gone around setup systems, and as you know, people have downloaded the uh, the best practices. Uh, so uh, a lot of times, people just you know don't really lock these down very well. 
Um, so basically all I'm saying is it's a liability on your network, not a control. So let's look at the security of it. Um, high, high target for attack. Um, so, okay, so if we're actually going to exploit this, um, by the way, I should say, I'm trying to get through like all the talking about things in about 20 minutes and then we'll have about 30 minutes of some demos and uh, then we'll be done with it. Uh, so just some theory of, of exploiting it. Uh, basically, how do you leverage complexity? Or, um, sorry, in a complex system, you want to leverage that to your advantage. Um, you know, if you have lots of systems, uh, these are usually in very large environments with very strict change control. Uh, so really, the defender is at the disadvantage. The attacker is, is obviously at the advantage. Um, no, nothing new here. Um, it was uh, very much, or identity management very much is kind of a, a hot topic right now. Um, it, I think, uh, last couple of years has been, uh, you know, kind of one of the, the emerging technologies. Um, and therefore, it's been rushed out by companies like Novell. Um, and I'm picking on Novell, but honestly, uh, go and look at any of the other ones. They're just as bad, if not worse. Um, actually, some of them are much worse. Uh, so, yes, I'm picking on Novell. And yes, Novell rushed out their product a couple of years ago. Um, they've done a lot of fixes to it, but, um, you know, it's still, you can definitely tell the code quality is, is not there. Um, or at least it's not where it should be, um, in, in my in my opinion. Um, when we look at, at an identity management system, we can attack it at a bunch of different layers. Um, obviously, um, most of the time you're going to be having a network in between your systems. Um, you know, sometimes you'll you'll be doing all this on one box, but um, I'm not really sure why you would do that in too many cases. So most of the time you have a network layer, you can attack that. Um, you have the connected systems. Um, Basically, you know, you have a, you know, one of your systems might be a Windows system, so you have, you know, the entire Windows stack you can attack. It might be a Linux system, you have the entire Linux stack you can attack, um, database, um, directories, you know, what have you. Uh, at the application layer, um, so the actual identity management engine that's going to be running all this, um, you know, the engine's just code, it has vulnerabilities, it has, it has bugs in it, um, so do all the agents that run all these connected systems. Um, and the management tools themselves uh, also have a lot of bugs. So you can tackle a lot of places in, in the actual system itself. Uh, and then the next layer down, the rules themselves. Um, so if someone has come in and said, hey, here are the business rules for this organization. We need to codify them. Um, you, you've then coded them into to some sort of logic that the, uh, the identity management system can understand. Um, and often these can be exploited. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll show you some examples of that. So uh, now I'm going to start picking on Novell because uh, you know they're what I know. But again, I do want to be very clear. Um, Novell is a great product. I do actually like a lot of their products. Um, I'm running SUSE Linux right here. Um, Microsoft identity management is a nightmare. Anyway, we won't even go there. So anyway, um, I pick it on them. But you know these are just some some examples, and and I really do want. Novell especially to uh, better their security, so that's why I'm picking on them. Uh, why am I presenting this stuff? Uh, basically, I think uh, Novell has made a few poor decisions in their architecture. Um, you know, whatever. Um, they made some decisions that aren't really clearly documented. I find a lot of people, a lot of customers will go, they'll implement, you know, the system as they think is best, and they don't really have any instructions on how to set up things securely. There's, there's really few very few best practices. And so they end up just setting it up horribly insecure as a result. Um, and uh, even when they do follow best practices, um, there are still a lot of ways that the, uh, the system can be exploited, um, you know, whether or not best practices have been used. Um, so we'll look at a couple of those. And uh, so minimal Novell identity manager system. You have eDirectory. Um, you have the meta directory engine, which is uh, you know, a big piece of code. I think I'd go into that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to cover all these more in depth. Um, meta directory engine is basically a set of Java libraries or uh, native code libraries, um, depending on the exact platform. Uh, eDirectory loads them in, and it, it does a bunch of rule processing and stuff for you. Uh, you. Uh, Within the identity management engine, there's the concept of drivers. Um, 
which are pieces of uh, rules, there's XML rules, uh, along with a, a native code component that translates the output of these rules to, to native code or uh, native application calls. Um, and uh, as I said, the driver rules and a shim, which is uh, basically a Java class which has a publisher and subscriber. All right, remote loader, because um, it is uh, running on a remote system, it does have a lot of interesting uh, characteristics. So uh, uh, the remote loader is basically a, a miniaturized, uh, uh, actually it's not a miniaturized engine, it's a uh, <laughs> application that loads, um, loads the shim in so that it takes XML and translates it to a uh, to native application protocols. Um, and basically connects to the IDM engine through uh, over the network. Um, password authentication for it. Um, and it uses an, an XML-ish protocol to, to communicate with the engine. So hopefully as you're sitting there, you're uh, kind of getting an idea of how complex these systems are, uh, if, you, if you weren't aware of it. Um, so how are these systems typically used? Um, basically, you, know, you kind of have your standard HR database, you know, often running on a Windows platform um, or you know, an Oracle platform, something like that. Usually has a remote loader out there, um, which is basically psyching things out of, out of HR, uh, putting that into some sort of enterprise directory, um, or so putting it into your e directory in, in Novell's case. And from there, you're synchronizing out to, to different uh, directories, different applications, that sort of thing. Um, and there's usually this flow from HR to the identity vault, and then you, know, you synchronize from there. Um, which has its own security implications. I mean, um, you know, spot the spot where, where your security concerns would be. Uh, another common configuration, basically, you know, you have Novell admins that do all their work in your legacy NDS tree that gets synchronized to to a meta directory, and, and then that gets synchronized out to you know, some sort of self-service portal, what have you. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, bringing Novell into an Active Directory environment. Uh, you know, some CTO says, hey, we're going to start doing Novell stuff. And so uh, the, the Windows admins keep doing everything in Active Directory, and it automatically synchronizes over to your Novell directory. Um, but this has, has some common, I mean, there's, there's some problems with this, right? Because uh, is Active Directory and eDirectory equally secure? Um, they can be. Um, I, I think there are ways that you can set up Active Directory to be secure. Um, I was, uh, back when I was working for a consulting company, uh, we went to a bank where it had this exact setup we didn't know at the time. It uh, took us about 45 minutes to compromise Active Directory, get, a, get an admin there. Um, that's because, uh, 45 minutes because uh, I, I had my firewall on on my TFTP server. It took us about half an hour to, to figure that out. Um, so we, you know, we, we got domain admin on Active Directory, couldn't figure out how to get into eDirectory. You know, we're sitting there banging on it. Uh, so we tried, you know, the, the admin user that we created in uh, Active Directory. You know, we thought, hey, why not? Let's give it a try. And lo and behold, it was there. Uh, automatically synchronized across. So we actually had an admin user in eDirectory as well as an admin user in Active Directory because uh, identity management system had, had very nicely synchronized that all across. So that's just something you have to keep in mind of, you know, when the further upstream you're going with your identities, uh, the more careful you need to be about how the systems are going to be broken into um, and protect them better um, or, or put in business rules to protect yourself when they do get broken into. So um, choosing your targets, obviously um, aim high in the identity flow because um, you're going to have a better payoff. If you compromise the HR database, then you can basically create any user you want in the system. Um, whereas if you're just, you know, compromising one way down at the end, um, you know, who knows, maybe it might synchronize back up might not, um, but this is going to be different from every environment. So I'm not saying you're making I'm not making any blanket statements about the uh, you know how you need to set out your network, um, but you just need to make those decisions, keep those uh, those uh, security implications in mind as you're as you're laying out your network. Um, just real quick, wanted to go over the security best practices from Novell. Um, there are some really good ideas here, things you really need to do. Uh, and some things that really don't help you at all. Um, so uh, their number one thing, use SSL. Um, absolutely, use SSL. It makes it a little bit harder to do certain types of attacks. It makes it impossible to do other types of attacks. And 
yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, it protects your, the confidentiality of someone just sniffing your network. Um, modern control access to your driver sets in your tree, obviously, by, by default, uh, very few permissions on those objects, so you should monitor the, them. Um, don't allow too much information in your password hints if you're doing password self-service, um, force password changes. Uh, follow industry best practices for security measures, such as blocking unused ports on the servers. Wow, that's a nice, nice statement there. Um, designer, if you're using uh, Novell's Designer, which is kind of their, their management uh, design tool as well as a management tool, um, in that case, you should limit your consultant's rights in your tree. I'm not sure why you only do that with uh, Designer, but you know, that, that's where the best practices stay. Uh, control your project files. Uh, basically, this is a, a thick application running on your, your consultant's laptop. It, uh, it stores the passwords. We'll, we'll cover that later. Um, and uh, don't use encrypted attributes because designer can't understand them. There's a great security best practice. Um, tracking changes to sensitive information. Basically, you know, audit things well. Um, all right, so that covers the, uh, the theory, exactly 20 minutes. Uh, let's talk about how we would actually go about doing some bad things to, uh, to one of these systems. Um, what would be the goals that we're trying to do? I mean, you know, we talk about exploiting a system. What are we actually trying to do? Um, someone yesterday was talking about how, uh, you know, the goal of your exploit is the data. I think it was H.D. Uh, Moore's talk. Uh, excellent. You know, the goal really is your data. I mean, it's whatever data you're trying to get at within the system. But to get at that, you, you, need, um, you need identities, you need authorization, uh, and that's what you're going to be attacking the, the identity management system to, to get. So uh, one goal is to just gain an identity. You know, if you can create your own user, great. Um, uh, if you can get a user created in one of the connected systems, you know, great. You know, not, not as much uh, access with there, but, you know, you still have access. Um, exceeding your authorization. Uh, you know, if you're an employee, you know, the identity management system says, hey, you're supposed to have access to these files, if you can uh, escalate that up and exceed what your, your, um, your authorization is uh, based on system rules, uh, great. Uh, stealing someone else's identity. Hey, if you can steal their, uh, their authentic authentication tokens, um, you can become them on the network. Um, not that difficult to do. Uh, and basically uh, violating the integrity of the auditing system. Um, so that's our goal. Uh, you come into a network, how are you going to actually find out whether or not it's running Identity Manager? You know, maybe some of you guys work at companies and you don't know, actually, if you're running Identity Management at your company. Or you've broken in over the internet and you, you don't know if this network has uh, Identity Manager installed. Um, first thing you're going to look for is uh, if you can you know, publicly browse the, uh, the LDAP directory. Uh, you can search for the, uh, the object class. Um, object class is, by default, uh, uh, readable by anonymous. So, um, you know, you can, anyone can anonymously connect to your LDAP ports and uh, look for object class equals direct small driver. Uh, that, that's a dead giveaway. Uh, if you come up to an iManager server, uh, there are a bunch of web pages uh, that you can look at. Um, if they don't have uh, Identity Manager, which, uh, you know, formerly DirectSML, if they don't have that installed, if they don't have the plugins to, to manage their identity management system installed on that version of iManager, then uh, these will come back with 404s if they, uh, if they do have the, the plugins installed to manage Identity Manager, you get 200 coming back. So easy way to find it. Uh, remote loader. Um, your remote loaders, uh, so there's, there's little applications that are they're basically just you know, translating XML to, uh, to native code. Uh, by default, they run on port uh, 8090. Um, that's kind of the, the default start one. Um, and then if multiple remote loaders are running on a system, it'll just increment up the ports. So. Looking for uh, open ports on uh, 8090 and above is cool, um, but they are only open when, uh, when the remote loader is listening for a connection, but the uh, engine has not actually initiated that connection. Uh, once it does that, then uh, the remote loader only talks to the, uh, only talks to the engine and uh, doesn't, doesn't listen to the network, and MAP does, does not return, or returns a closed port in that case. Uh, lastly, file system, you know, I don't know how many people uh, have access to their, uh, to their Linux servers that are running directories, but, uh, you know, if you do, uh, user lib, direct smell, or cnovel remote loader, um, just two of the places you can look to find the, uh, the installation. Um, so these are complex systems, lots of systems involved. Um, obviously, you can do Windows exploits. I mean, you know, name an exploit, and you can probably exploit a component of an identity management system. 
Um, but you know, nothing new there. Um, exploits in the actual identity management system itself. So in the actual code that manages the identities, um, that that was interesting to me. Um, you know, saw some things that looked a little bit ugly. As I mentioned, code code quality looked a little bit poor to me. So it was something I, I kind of took a look into. Um, so again, you have a med directory engine, you have some shims, um, you have a remote loader, lots of good stuff to, uh, lots of good targets to look at. So um, three slides back, I, I kind of mentioned a you know, very trivial denial of service, um, which, you know, very simple, basically, we have uh, um, remote loaders running on a remote system, listens to the network, uh, but as soon as someone connects it to it, um, it turns off. So you know what, um, Netcat, great denial of service tool. Uh, just connecting to the port if you see it open, um, and it uh, basically your your engine can no longer connect in. Uh, as long as you don't send it anything, um, it will hold that port open for forever, uh, just waiting for you to uh, initiate with your password. Um, so if you open the port, um, basically the whole system can never uh, can't talk to the engine. Um, why is that a problem? Obviously, if you're you know going to be deleted from a system and you know that um, running denial of service is is pretty critical because if you can deny deny service on that connected system, then obviously you can't be deprovisioned, you can't have your authorization changed, um, and you know whatever access you have on that system you're going to maintain because because you can't get updated. Um, I was going to demonstrate that, but yeah, oh well. Uh, Ran a fuzzer on this, you know, we're connected over a network. Um, let's look at some fuzzing statistics. Uh, basically, it took about a minute to five minutes to crash the remote loader. Um, it, when we were doing a pure Java um, remote loader, so the remote loader was pulling in a pure Java library, basically Java would just get so confused and couldn't tell, you know, one side thought it was open, the other side would try to connect and it was closed and uh, all sorts of confusion there. And basically, we'd just come to a halt, not be able to resolve itself after about five minutes. If you load in an actual uh, native code, like the, uh, the Active Directory driver, uh, you actually crash the application in about one minute. Um, I do have dumps if anyone knows how to write good exploits, um, talk to me. Uh, and about 20 minutes to crash the engine. Uh, basically, if you're fuzzing the engine side, um, it took about 20 minutes for the, uh, the engine just to go to all weird. Um, again, very heavy use of Java, so, you know, I, I don't think any of them can be used for a uh, you know, remote exploit, but you can definitely throw into weird states where it just doesn't know what it's doing. Um, and I did not get around to fuzzing the XML uh, definitions that are actually held up in the directory, so directory objects that, that contain all these XML files. Um, been trying to uh, do that, but I have to write my own fuzzer for that and um, haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, oh, DX command, uh, which is kind of the command line utility that uses to, that's, uh, uses NCP to control the, uh, the driver functionality. Um, yeah, it, it basically choked on the first packet that got fuzzed, so um, it would just quit with the Java dump. Um, so not real reliable. You know, it's for something that's really managing all your identities, um, not, not all that reliable. Uh, so, you know, let's say we, uh, we can't fuzz things. Uh, if we own one of the systems, um, if, we, if we actually control your identity management, um, control the, the meta directory, so the, the e-directory, uh, we can just go and change the business rules pretty much any time we want. Um, of course, if you're an attacker, you go in and change the rules, that's, that's pretty much, you know, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> and you have to have admin in e-directory. So, you know, not too useful, but obviously someone who's attacking your identity management system, they can do this. Um, and, and what controls do you have in place to prevent someone from doing that? That's a question you can answer. Um, modifying the system uh, libraries and the applications that are up there. Um, on a Linux stack, you know, running uh, I, for my demo system, I'm, I'm running OES here with uh, with eDirectory. Um, good default permissions in the directory. Great, uh, you know, file permissions are are very tight. Um, we then go over to Windows side and. Uh, Full control is granted to everyone by default after a default install. So I had a little fun with that. Um, basically, I thought, hey, you know, if I can create my own uh, shim, you know, with, without anyone noticing, since full control is given to everyone, so, you know, me being everyone, I could uh, just log in and change out the shim. 
Why not? Uh, so, uh, in our test tree here, um, basically we have a uh, remote loader, remote console here, um, which is you know, just controlling the connections to our, uh, to our different uh, remote loaders that are running here. Uh, one of them is uh, conveniently named driver to be Trojan, um, which is just a limited text driver. Um, it's up there, up there in our tree. I can, uh, yeah, wrong way. So it's uh, you know just driver running in my tree. Uh, so what do we do? Um, basically, when the remote loader starts up, it reads the uh, Novell remote loader lib directory, pulls in every single jar file, uses that as your class path, and then. Uh, if you look back at any of your uh, the properties of any of your remote loaders, the uh, the uh, Java class that's supposed to be called to, to initiate this, this shim, it's listed right there. So uh, two things we need to do: we either need to swap out what that class points to within this directory, which is a little bit difficult. You get into some uh, you know files being locked and stuff when you try to swap that out, or you just change them all. Uh, so that's you know just wanted to demo that real quick in case. Uh, Someone doesn't quite believe me. Uh, basically, went and uh, downloaded the, uh, the driver SDK from Novell, compiled my own driver, added in a little bit of code that wrote a file to a uh, writes out a file to the, the C, you know, the, the root directory. Um, I'm not a Windows person, so if I talk a little bit Unixy, yeah, sorry. Uh, so basically, writes a file out to your C directory, um, and then starts up like a normal driver. So we'll just you know copy that over since we have full control on uh, the lib directory. Uh, that's cool. So now we have to uh, make sure that when the driver starts up next time, it, it points to the right class. It points to our hostile class. So we'll uh, we'll go conveniently. Our, our remote loader told us what what the uh, config file name is, which was uh, config. So uh, there is our class. Just swap that out real quick because that's fun. We'll uh, save that, and obviously this is loaded in memory, so you know it's not looking at the config file right now. Um, like I said, uh, you know, with, after I fuzz this a few times, you know, it's it's not that easy or not that difficult to crash one of these drivers. Um, so you know, causing a, a denial of service on these is, is far too uh, far too easy. So, uh, but for demonstration's sake, I'm just going to stop it. Um, so our C drive, you know, no, no weird files there. So let's start up our driver. And demo gods do not. There we go. So, woo. Uh, basically, what it did: start up the driver. Driver, my custom driver, wrote out a file to the C drive, and it's running as local system. So basically, you can do whatever you want. Um, and uh, you know, is some admin actually going to notice this? You know, they would. Get in their log files that you know. Hey, maybe the the, uh, the remote loader restarted. That's about it. Um, so that was fun. Uh, go build your own by go downloading the SDK. Just use Ant to build the uh, build the default um, examples there, and uh, add in wherever you want. Uh, so we wrote our own shim. Can we write our own remote loader? You know that. Uh, might be possible. I uh, looked at that, and said, you know, hey, uh, basically, the engine is going there. It's you know, it's given the IP address or uh, you know, the DNS name of the remote side. Uh, can we write our own? That's gonna that's gonna mimic that and uh, do some password stealing. Um, I tried it out. Um, one of the things I'd overcome was you know, basically, they recommend to use SSL on this, um, but kind of get to that, they use it in kind of a weird way that um, uh, basically SSL is used to authenticate the engine, but it's never used to authenticate the remote loader. So even if we're using SSL, we can uh, get around that because it's not cryptographically uh, protected. It's, uh, it's just uh, authenticated by password. Uh, and there's basically two different passwords that are used, uh, your driver object password and your remote loader password. Um, and uh, your remote loader password is actually used in two different ways, uh, one for the, uh, the command uh, the little command window that actually controls the driver, and it's also used for the engine connecting in. So, um, 
pictorially, hey, your remote loader's there, listens to the network, cool. Uh, password authentication, um, when the command piece goes in and, and tries to connect to your remote loader, um, it does this great cryptographic challenge response. It takes a timestamp and it, it, it hashes it a couple times, uh, you know, verifies that both sides know the password without ever passing the, uh, the password over the network. Beautiful. That, that's how it should be done. Uh, when we're talking about the connection between the engine and the remote loader, um, your passwords get sent in clear text. Um, I, I don't know why. But anyway, uh, they do. So because of that, we can write our own uh, little Trojan. Um, one thing I just want to point out, um, many people use the same password for these, these multiple passwords, and nowhere in the Novell documentation does it say, hey, use different passwords for these. So every Novell training you go to, um, most Novell consultants I've talked to, they always use the same password for the driver object and the remote loader. Bad idea, because your engine is saying, hi, here's my password. Um, now authenticate to me. And uh, if you're coming back with the same exact password, that's, you know, that's just too easy. So, um, you know, it's easy. Um, oh. So, because it's easy, uh, I decided to write a little tool to do it for me. Um, have a little uh, server I'm going to start up. Uh, and then the other thing I need to do is uh, basically... You know, there, there are many different ways, ARP spoofing, DNS redirection, you know, plenty of ways that you can get a, uh, get, you know, redirect where this, this uh, engine is talking to. Um, for demo sake, because the demo gods hate me, uh, I'm just going to go in and change the, the, uh, the IP address if it ever decides to load. So, uh, ah. so formerly we're connected to our remote loader directly. I'm just going to uh, change that to go to my server, which ten dot four, and uh, so as soon as you make a change, it's going to restart the driver. Woohoo! And uh, let's go see what we got. We didn't get anything. There we go. So basically, we was just listening to the network. The uh, engine said, hey, here's my uh, remote loader password. And uh, please authenticate me and start talking to me. I basically said, great, thank you for that password. I'm going to turn around and use that. Just try and use that for my, uh, my driver object password. And uh, so I passed it back using the right protocol. And uh, it gave me a success message, so I know now that my, my passwords are the same. And it prints out here. Um, this little tool here will be up on, uh, uh, or will be pointed to, I, I haven't quite figured out a good place to host it yet, but uh, I hate novell.blogger.com. Um, I'll, I'll put it up there. Uh, SSL, you know, again, I'm just going to mention Novell does some great things with cryptography, and then every once in a while you just wonder what were they thinking. Um, so they've made it very, very difficult to talk to remote loader as a fake uh, direct ML engine. But it's really easy to talk to it as a fake remote loader because there's no cryptographic um, authentication of the remote loader. Either it's physically impossible to, to load a certificate up on the engine side. And uh, so um, that makes it all possible. Uh, however, they do, do use a really funky version of, of uh, TLS so I'm still kind of working out that to get this tool to, to run under SSL, but uh, uh, it should not be a problem. Uh, like I said, it is possible. Um, okay, using the rules. Um, basically, uh, to, to actually you know, figure out how you're going to use the rules to your advantage, um, you, know, you have to know what rules are up there. Fortunately, you can just do an LDAP search anonymously on, on your directory tree, and by default, you can get back the names of all the drivers, because you know it's, a, it's in your CN, you know it's in it's in your uh, your RDN. So pretty much anyone can go there and read what rules you have defined for your your uh, your IDM installation, uh, and they can compare those to the default rules. Because you know most people go, they download the uh, the drivers from Novell, they use you know most of the default rules, they change a few, and uh, so people can basically read 
what your business logic is uh, based off of just an anonymous search of your tree, unless you, you turn that off, which I highly recommend. Um, so, for example, if I go up and read that you have an Active Directory driver up there, and you know, um, I know that Active Directory driver by default uh, matches on full name, and I can control one side. You know, obviously, I can I can uh, start exploiting that by by exploiting the default business logic that, that Novell gave you. Um, and obviously, if you have some custom logic in there, um, I'm not going to know that as as anonymous attacker or as an anonymous attacker, but as you know, a reasonably tech savvy person in your corporation. Um, I can probably make some good guesses at it. Uh, exploiting the rule processing. Uh, this is another fun one. Basically, your shim is taking XML code, translating it over to native application calls, and uh, different drivers handle it differently. Every single one of these shims is written by a different person. Uh, you have vastly different code quality. Um, I happen to have done a lot of work with the uh, JDBC and, and doing database connections. Uh, so I had some fun with it, um, and uh, yeah, basically by default, if you just do a default install of the JDBC driver, uh, this nice little rule comes in there where it takes your uh, your common name and uses it in a uh, in an update statement on your on your SQL server uh, running as DBO. So uh, hopefully most of you get where I'm going with this, uh, and uh, within the next ten minutes, we will uh, quickly demonstrate. Uh, um, a SQL injection in DirectSmell processing. So, have a little uh, table here. This is my default database. Uh, basically, just a default install of, of the database uh, straight from Novell, so you can go and duplicate this yourself. Uh, Add it in this little table for my little proof of concept. Uh, I'm now going to add in a user, there we go, to my directory. Uh, that one guy had a few special things added to him. And uh, let's see. So uh, got a few errors. Um, and in this table, hello DEF CON, yes, we have SQL injection in your driver. Uh, this is a default driver from Novell. So uh, anyone using the default driver from Novell should uh, check up on this. Uh, SQL injections. Uh, last one, um, passwords. Uh, a couple different places that we deal with passwords. Obviously, uh, a lot of people use identity management for passwords. Um, don't use passwords. Okay, I can't can't say it enough. Do not use passwords. Uh, they are the weakest form of authentication, but unfortunately, a lot of you have to use them, so you don't have a choice. So let's be careful. We we'll at least know what's where your passwords are going. Using identity management for uh, for Active Directory um, on the Windows side, you're going to have a password filter, which is basically just a little DLL that you've put in Active Directory which says, hey, every time someone changes their password in Active Directory, write it out to this, uh, this registry key. It, it does encrypt it. Uh, so if you go and look at it, they don't, Novell has not, I couldn't find out from Novell publicly how that encryption worked. Uh, so all I can say is, is it is encrypted. Um, go and look at those keys yourself if you can find a way to decrypt it. Um, cool. Uh, write a utility for it. Uh, universal passwords. Um, so this is actually where my my um, dislike of Novell started, and, and I have a rocky um, history with them as a result. Uh, but basically, they decided as a company to go with this whole idea of universal password, which was, hey, let's store our passwords in eDirectory instead of using this you know great hashing function that NDS has been using for years. Let's store them just encrypted with with triple des. Okay. Um, we're also storing the key to decrypt it on the server, so uh, that's that's a problem. If you're storing the encrypted version along with the key, um, is that really encrypted? Uh, we can debate that, but um, for the most part, it works pretty well. Uh, basically, access into those passwords is uh, controlled by a couple factors. You have to be an admin. You have to have rights to that to that directory object, which is by default only given to admin. Uh, you have to access it over SSL. If you're accessing it in clear text, it, it won't give it back to you. Um, and uh, there's password policies that, that govern you know, whether or not admin can read the password. Of course, admin owns these policies, and admin can change the policies whenever they want. Uh, that was kind of my, uh, my uh, reason for thinking that this was kind of a bad scheme. So as a result, um, yes, it is possible. You, know, you have your password policies. So as admin, I can just go in them and change them to say, hey, let me read them. 
I can then uh, basically just go and ask the directory, say, hey, give me everyone's password, and I have them. Um, yes, this is what you're forced to use if you're using password synchronization with Identity Manager 3.0 or later. You have to use universal password, and universal passwords are just encrypted passwords, and encrypted passwords can be decrypted. I think I've hammered it enough. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, yeah, speaking of passwords, um, I mentioned uh, Designer, which is that you know, nice little management tool, uh, has an encoded password. And they do warn you about this. Uh, if you read the documentation, it says do not store your admin password in here. Um, I was going to put up, I, I couldn't find my, my Perl script to, to decrypt it, but basically it's Base64 encoded and you take the, uh, it's basically Base64 encoded string and you take the first character of every, every three characters and move it to the last one and then you just Base64 decode it and you have the password back. It's those kind of things that just annoy me because I'm, I'm, I'm a crypto guy and, you know, <laughs> you can encrypt things so easily. Why would you base 64 encode something and then do some transposition to, uh, to encrypt it? I don't know. Um, but, you know, those are types of things I, I get mad about. Uh, so coming up on the end of this talk, I just wanted to say um, whoever wrote uh, The Art of Fuzzing, your, uh, your proxy fuzzer is my friend. I found that tool. I love it. Um, great tool, little, nice little Python script. Um, does great for fuzzing network connections. Um, while I was in here uh, doing this presentation, uh, I wrote a little Perl script to go in and bulk update uh, every attribute to uh, to uh, you know a fixed string uh, on on your user a test user in your database. I recommend people doing this with things like you know common SQL injections, uh, cross site scripting. Um, I didn't get to it because I don't have time, but um, yeah, do some cross-site scripting and then try and view your user with iManager. Um, you get some great results. Uh, but I'll have that script up on, uh, up on the website as well or you know, link to it somewhere so I figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, fake remote loader, yeah, I'll, I'll throw that up there as well. Um, just go for it, use it. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, yeah, there's several places where iManager just chokes when you when you uh, rewrite uh, people's attributes. Um, it's it's pretty ugly. Uh, Novell Audit, um, another good application in theory, bad in implementation. Uh, or uh, sorry, there's just been lots of bugs in implementation. Um, and uh, fortunately, it's been replaced by Novell Sentinel. Uh, so cool stuff. Uh, really easy to fingerprint your drivers. User application. Uh, this is a huge application. It's your Linux server running JBoss with uh, this entire uh, portal application on top of it. Uh, it's kind of the, the new Identity Manager 3, if you're uh, familiar with Novell. It was one of the big selling features of, of IDM 3. Um, and uh, basically, again, it was just not the highest code quality. Um, uh, lots of ugly things in there in the whole implementation. And I, I don't even have time to, uh, to do all the write-ups on those, um, but you know, maybe next year. Uh, and then designer, I haven't even started looking at designer yet, um, other than you know, the little password thing. Um, so lots of work to be done. Um, basically, as I can't find anyone else there out here who is doing research on the security of identity management systems. So if you're out there, please talk to me, because I'd love to uh, bang some ideas off of you. Um, but uh, yeah. I'm, out there doing it by myself at the moment and uh, would, would love some help. Uh, we don't really have much time, but um, basically, um, you know, whatever background you come from, uh, you guys might think I'm crazy. Maybe I am crazy. <laughs> Maybe I just think this is bad design because uh, some personal flaw, but I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm way off. Maybe I'm right. Who knows? Um, you guys can make up your own mind. Um, so conclusion, hopefully uh, all you guys who raise your hands saying you're running uh, Novell Identity Manager, um, you're aware of some ways people might exploit your system. Maybe you can uh, go back and, and you know, just put on your security hat, take a look at your system, and, and remember it's not invulnerable. Uh, yeah, I hope Novell, you know, takes a look at their, uh, their own stuff. And uh, I really do hope, you know, someone out there sees it. And uh, I have one minute, and uh, someone else you know, comes, joins me doing some fun stuff. That's it. Um, I have some more stuff I skipped, but, you know, that's what the Q&A room is for afterwards. So thank you.